Hello, this is Miss Kilburn Bond from Malmesbury School. I'm making this video about the poem Ozymandias by Percy Shelley in the hope that it helps you understand the poem as you prepare for your GCSE exam or even if you're just reading it for pleasure. So um, I'm going to start off just by telling you the aims of what I'm going to try and do. First of all, it's really important that we just read and understand the main feelings and attitudes in the poem and that will be for assessment objective one for your GCSE exam showing that you have a basic understanding of what the poem is about. Then for assessment objective two it's important that you can analyse so you can really pick apart what the effect is of how Shelley's chosen to use language form and structure so throughout the video I'll give you some ideas about how you can do that. And then finally you also need to show an appreciation of the context of the poem so when the poem was written what sorts of things might have influenced Shelley in the ideas he was getting across that's assessment objective three and because it's Shelley um, it's really important that we talk about the idea of him being a romantic poet so if you don't already know what that means hopefully you will do by the end of this video. So we're going to start off with a little bit of the history, the context, because that's going to help us before we even start reading. So I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about Ramesses II, who ruled Egypt for 67 years in the 13th century. He was a military conqueror and a great builder, so he's renowned for the work that he did in really building up um, Egypt when it was under his control. Under his rule the culture and the economy flourished, the money and wealth came from neighbouring countries that he'd a habit of invading and taking from though, so you know, yes he did make himself and his people have a lot more money than they did before but that came of the, at the expense of those people who he'd invaded, so that perhaps gives you a little bit of an idea about him and the way that he ruled. He was actually known as Ramesses the Great, so people did see that he had achieved these great things. The ancient Greeks gave him another name, they called him Ozymandias, and Ramesses II loved the fact he was called Ozymandias, and he actually took that name on himself. It comes from these two Greek words, Ozium, meaning breath or air, and Mandias, which is linked to the word mandate, which means to rule. So if you put those two meanings together, that gives you another hint about why he might have loved being given that name Ozymandias. And you'll have seen in some of those images statues, and I'm sure you've seen before um, from ancient Egypt pictures of statues being really important to their culture. Egyptian kings were actually considered to have divine status, so links to God if you like, and their statues were always massive, deliberately awe-inspiring. They didn't show the pharaohs as they really were, but they showed them deliberately as being perfect, godlike. They were always young in their statues, handsome, athletic and powerful. And the kings themselves really believed that their legacies would last forever. They felt that their power was was close to that of a god and like a god they'd be worshipped forever. That was their hope and aim. So if we put all of those things together about what we've learned about Ozymandias and about the pharaohs generally and that belief in the power and being having this divine power, what sort of adjectives do you think we could use to describe him? Because this is going to be really important to understanding what the poem is about. So I'm just going to give you a little moment Think about what kind of adjective might you use to describe a leader who enjoyed a name that implied that he ruled everything, even ruled the air. And perhaps one of the words you might have come up with is on the screen in front of you now. Maybe you thought arrogant, having or revealing an exaggerated sense of one's own importance or abilities. Maybe you thought of the word conceited, a very similar word, being excessively proud of oneself, vain. Egotistic, egotistical, excessively conceited or absorbed in oneself, self-centred. You might have thought boastful or even a show-off, showing excessive pride and self-satisfaction in one's achievements, possessions or abilities. And maybe you thought of this word, but a word I wanted to introduce you to today, which isn't very often used in our society at the moment, is hubristic, which is a, um adjective, or hubris as the noun. It means being excessively proud or self-confident. So hubris, if you do any research on the internet about the poem, you're almost guaranteed to come across this 
word hubris, is an extreme or foolish pride or dangerous overconfidence often in combination with arrogance. And in ancient Greek tragedies, hubris always led to a tragedy. And it's certain that Shelley had this word, this idea in mind when he wrote the poem about Ozymandias, because what we're going to see is a story about a man whose extreme pride and dangerous overconfidence leads to him looking quite silly really by the end of the poem in Shelley from Shelley's perspective. So that's a word that if you want to challenge yourself you could learn and maybe use when you are annotating your poem. And on that note if you haven't done already then pause the video now and make sure that you have got your copy of your anthology, the copy of the poem in front of you and some highlighters pencils, something that you're going to annotate that poem with because that's really going to help you and it might be that that word hubris is one of the first things that you make a note of. So moving on but still sticking to this idea of history, in the early 1800s many people in Britain actually became quite obsessed with ancient Egypt. So it was a time when people were learning a lot about the society in ancient Egypt and there were lots of discoveries of things like the statues and mummies that were being frequently reported in British newspapers and sometimes being brought back to British museums. So Shelley was obviously aware of this and it was something that people around him would have been interested in. We actually know that Shelley had read a book in which a description of the remains of a statue of Ramesses II had been found and that book has got a translation of an inscription that's found around one of the statues of Ramesses. And the quote from that book is this, I am Ozymandias, king of kings. If any would know how great I am and where I lie, let him excel me in any of my works. So if we go back, you can see those words of those qualities of arrogance and hubris in that quotation. But also we can see that this is a poem that's been inspired by by a real event, although the poem is about a lot more than that and hopefully that will be revealed later. It was soon after the British Museum announced that they'd actually acquired a large fragment of one of the statues of Ramesses II that Shelley wrote his poem Ozymandias and it's believed it was written sometime between December 1817 and January 1818. Shelley hadn't seen the statue himself but he certainly would have heard about it and as we've seen he had read about the culture of ancient Egypt so he uses this idea to write a poem that's actually about power and ruling more generally. So I think now we need to look at the poet himself so Percy Bysshe Shelley, a romantic poet, and this idea of him being a romantic poet is going to help you when you write about the poem. So hopefully um, this will be explained quite clearly and it's something that you could go and research for hours and hours. In fact, many university lecturers would be spending a lot of time explaining the romantic poet. So this is a very brief overview that I hope will help you. So, born in 1792, Shelley was part of the radical anti-establishment generation of writers who we now refer to as the Romantics. So he's got friends, names from poetry you might have heard of like Byron, Wordsworth and Keats. Now they didn't call themselves the Romantics and romantic in this context doesn't mean a story about love where it's all very gushy at the end. It means something very different. We now use the word the Romantics to describe this group of poets and writers and artists and what they stood for, their views, which were radical, so that means they were going against what most other people perhaps thought at the time, and they were anti-establishment. They weren't frightened to criticise the people who had power in their society. So most obviously politicians, the government, royalty and the church. So during the Romantic period, there were lots of violent rebellions in Europe and in the New World. So this was um, a time in the world where there was a lot of people who were rebelling against their government and looking for reasons to, to war fight. So worried by this, the British government was becoming increasingly more controlling and bringing in rules and reacting to situations in quite a firm way that the Romantic poets really didn't agree with and they felt it was their duty to inform and inspire others to denounce the exploitation of the poor, to follow ideals rather than imposed rules and protect individual liberties. So they were a group of people who, who wanted to rebel, who wanted to use their art, their writing, their poetry to encourage other people to think that 
your individual freedom is more important than feeling that you have to follow rules that are being forced on you by a bigger organisation. And the last thing that you need to know about romantic poetry before we really look at the poem is the concept of the sublime. Now, this term really talks about the way that romantic poets saw nature. So it conveys the feelings people experience when they see that true power is never achieved by humans, but is always present in nature. And that was central to a lot of the romantic poetry that you might come across. This idea that true power, a true feeling of awe and feeling close to something that might resemble how someone might talk about God would be to look at nature and actually as a human you would never be able to recreate or impersonate that that true power and that idea of timelessness. If you understand those ideas and that's really going to help you appreciate the poem Ozymandias and it's that poem that we're going to have a look at now. So we're going to listen to um, somebody reading the poem. As you listen to it I want you just, you can just listen the first time, but then I want you to pause the video and then read it yourself at least twice because every time you read the poem, it's going to sink in a little bit more and meanings will begin to reveal themselves that perhaps you missed the first time. So enjoy the reading of the poem and then we'll start trying to pick it apart and understand some of the details. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. I wonder if anyone recognised that voice as that of Brian Cranston, who plays um, Walter White, the anti-hero, in the American TV drama Breaking Bad. And why he reads that poem is because it was actually used as the trailer for the very final season of Breaking Bad, which I think says quite a lot about how popular and powerful this poem is. And also, if you know Breaking Bad, um, that message of the poem, that kind of idea that the powerful fall no matter how mighty they think they might be. So as we do start to go through the poem, I'm not going to be annotating on the screen like you might have seen in other teachers' videos um, because I don't want you to copy exactly what I'm saying. I think it's much more useful for you if you listen and then you put your annotations and your notes into your own words because that will help you to understand the poem. What I have done to try and help you though is as I go through sections of the poem you'll see that part of the poem on the screen and you'll also see a little book in the corner that says literary terms and where I'm using language terminology that you possibly haven't come across before or that are really specific to English literature then I've given you that word with a definition so if at any point you need to pause the video and have a look at that and think about if it's a word you'd like to use then hopefully that's there to help you. Okay so Ozymandias one of Shelley's most famous poems now, um, possibly if we could interview him he might be surprised by that, is actually a poem that he wrote as part of a competition with a friend. Um, so they both made an agreement that they would have a go in a certain time frame of writing a sonnet. So a sonnet is a particular type of poem, very popular um, Shakespeare, you might be aware, very famous for writing an awful lot of sonnets. It's got a very strict set of rules. Then it's a poem that's always got 14 lines and then there are two main types of sonnets without wanting to get too complicated. And what Shelley does in this poem is he actually merges these things together. He was a writer, a person who wasn't afraid of breaking the rules sometimes, but it's typically a poem that's written in iambic pentameter and he uses this idea, he uses this very famous, well-known, structured poem 
to tell the story of Ozymandias. And you know, if we start with the title, he gives the title the name of his main character, Ozymandias, suggesting that this is the focus of the poem. Although it's fair to say that you can look at this poem as a metaphor. It appears to be about Ozymandias, but actually it's also about perhaps other individuals and certainly about leaders and rulers in general. Some people think Shelley was actually directing the poem at King George III, who would have been the king when he was writing. Some people have even suggested that it's a poem um, about religion, maybe even Jesus, because Shelley is someone who very unusually in his time was vocal about not being religious. Um, but certainly it's a poem that is a metaphor about anyone who feels as a ruler, as a leader, that they can enforce their power on everybody in a cruel and oppressive way. It's also a poem that's got lots of internal rhymes. So that's a rhyme that occurs in the middle of the lines in poetry rather than just at the ends of the lines. And if you wanted to look at the poem in even more detail, then that's something I'd suggest you could have a little look for, do a bit more extra reading about afterwards. But what we're going to do is now just go through the poem line by line and try and pull out some of those main meanings. So we start at the beginning then. I met a traveller from an antique land who said. So just pause there and we're going to think about the word structure. Now structure is how a poem is organised, how it's put together and what's interesting in this poem is that it's got a layered structure where we have the poet Shelley who's writing the poem, we have our first narrator I met, someone who could be Shelley or could be somebody else and then we've got another layer of storytelling as well. We've got the traveller who we meet at the beginning of the poem. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, and what follows in quotation marks is actually the rest of the poem. So the poet, our first narrator, the I, and then the traveller. And we also later in the poem actually have a quotation from the voice of Ozymandias himself. So there are lots of layers in this poem of narrative, lots of storytelling layers. And this is interesting and it's also really important because what Shelley does is he separates and distances us as the reader from Ozymandias. We don't see Ozymandias firsthand ourselves. We hear about the story from somebody else who's bumped into someone else who's told them about the story. And what this does is it makes this king even further away, even less significant. And what we'll see when we get to the end of the poem, and hopefully you've picked up on this already, this was a king who thought that he was going to be important and remembered forever. And what Shelley does from the very first line is makes it absolutely obvious that this king is now just the subject of vague storytelling, is somebody who's totally removed from the experience of the immediate reader and that's really clever the antique land just showing how out of date and old and distant this story is so i met a traveler from an antique land who said and this is where we start listening to that story two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert so this is a description of one of these huge statues of Ozymandias that now has been destroyed and there are just rem remnants of it left. Two vast and trunkless legs of stone. So we've got the legs with no body, it's absolutely huge and it's standing in the middle of a desert, a barren landscape where nothing else is growing. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered vis visage lies. Now that's the face, that's kind of the shattered face of this pharaoh. So we've got some alliteration there already that's worth pointing out. We've got the stone stand in the desert and then we've got the sand half sunk and shattered. It's actually sibilance too isn't it because we've got that repeated sound. Now what that alliteration, that sibilance does is it draws lots of these words together and gives them more strength when we're listening to the poem. And this is a poem about strength, it's a poem about power. This is a huge stone sculpture and it's set in the sand of the desert. By the end of the poem we're going to realise that the sand and the desert is much more powerful than the sculpture and 
than the king could ever be. So that's quite an interesting thing to pick up on. So just moving on a little bit. Half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculpture well those passions read. So what we've got here is a close-up description now of the face that's lying in the sand. Half sunk, so we can't even see the whole face, half of it's already been sunk into the sand. A shattered, so a broken face lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command. I'm just going to pause there because what we've just read is a really detailed description of what we can tell from that face and it uses something called syndetic listing which is a word you don't need to learn I've just put it in for those of you who want to challenge yourselves but it's where a list is offered that uses a conjunction the word and to connect those items and ideas in the list so we've got a frown and a wrinkled lip and a sneer of cold command. And sometimes repeating that word and in list can just exaggerate this idea that you're trying to suggest as a writer is not just one thing that you want to concentrate on, there's something else and then there's something else. And if we look at those three things, they're connected by being very negative images. We've got a frown, which is an obvious um, description of an emotion that's disapproving, that's not happy. Then we've got the wrinkled lip, which suggests uh, unhappiness again, maybe a kind of meanness, and that's definitely reinforced by this description of the sneer, like an evil, a cruel smile of cold command. So that synthetic listing is deliberately bringing together that there are lots of things, even just from half of a face in the statue, that suggest Ozymandias as not being a particularly nice character, as a character who enjoyed perhaps cruelty towards others. And there's that lovely alliteration in cold command, that very harsh sound of cold and command, which reinforces this idea of him as an aggressive and an arrogant ruler. And what happens next in the next line is that those features are then linked to the power of the sculptor who would have made this statue. Tell that it's sculptor well those passions read. Now as we know Shelley was a romantic poet and he believed that artists were more powerful than politicians and more important than politicians and a sculptor of course is a form of being an artist so the artist's power in being this brilliant sculptor who's been able out of stone to create the sense of this leader having this sneer this mean smile and a wrinkled lip and the frown of perhaps being cruel or unhappy all the time it's this sculptor who is actually taking up the poem here, who's the person who we can admire. Their creativity has remained. Most of the statue is hidden and destroyed in the sand. The king is long dead, but the talent and the brilliance of the sculptor has lived on. And this is part of the idea of this as a romantic poem, that it's the artist who's actually ended up having more power than this tyrannous leader. So if we link that to the next part of the poem, tell us its sculptor while well, those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. So it's what the sculptor has achieved that lives on. It's the sculptor who's shown the true talent in being able to reveal the emotions, the true feelings of, of this leader. And it's an ambiguous part of the poem. Ambiguous means that it's open to more than one interpretation. It's not absolutely obvious and different people will see different things. If you watch another five videos are made by various English teachers and English lecturers on this, you might hear slightly different views as to what this line, these lines might mean. And that makes the poem more interesting. And it's up to you to decide what you think, or maybe you want to kind of fall halfway and think it could mean both things on purpose. Certainly, I want to talk about this line, the hand that mocked them. So, which yet survives, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed, because I like to think that Shelley's talking about the hand of the sculptor here, and that by mocked them, 
he means more than just copying what Ozymandias looked like, he means mocked in the sense of deliberately um, laughing, laughing at what Ozymandias was like, deliberately exaggerating this mean look and I like the image in my mind that Ozymandias didn't realise that actually the sculpture was sculptor, sorry, was almost taking the Mickey out of him, if you like, was being satirical and exposing him for what he was as this cruel, tyrannous, vain leader. And so we move on now from looking at what's remaining of, of the statue of the person to the pedestal. So that's what the statue's standing on. And on the pedestal the words appear, my name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works ye mighty, and despair. Now this is the third voice in the poem if you like, this is the voice of our leader Ozymandias, these are the words that supposedly he wanted to live on, he wanted people in the future to look at and think about what a brilliant leader he felt he was. My name is Ozymandias, it's immediately self-centred, it's absolutely a vainglorious inscription about himself. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Interestingly, King of Kings also is used in the Bible to describe Jesus and that is used as a religious reading of the poem, maybe being a criticism of religion as well. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. But what's really obvious and the most important thing for you to understand is that in this quotation from the pedestal it's absolutely clear this idea of hubris here, this arrogance, the idea that Ozymandias felt that he was somebody who had absolute power and that that power was going to last into the future so that leaders of the future might look at his statue and be envious of all the things that Ozymandias felt that he had achieved. And this is where the word irony comes into this poem. So irony is when something has a different or opposite result from what you might expect. It's deliberately introduced by Shelley that Ozymandias believed when he set that inscription up as what he wanted to be written on the pedestal that people would look at his words and feel intimidated and respectful of what he's achieved. The irony is that that's not what happened at all. The irony is that rather than looking at this a brilliant huge colossal statue and looking at everything he's achieved and despairing, what we're seeing is a sort of despairing picture of something that's broken and forgotten about and just abandoned in the desert and that's where the irony in the poem exists and that helps us understand that Shelley doesn't want us to admire Ozymandias, he wants us to see that Ozymandias represents his views on how leaders who rule in this way are wrong and don't deserve to live on in the future whereas artists and their art definitely do deserve that. So then we come to this simple sentence, nothing beside remains. And those three words really beautifully bring an end to our focus on Ozymandias as the person. And that again is really deliberately achieved by Shelley. He wants to demolish the voice of the king with those three words. We had a little snippet, we saw via the sculptor, sculptor how he was someone who had this sneer, who represented cruelty in the way that he led his people. Then we had this moment where we could hear what he wanted to say, but that's been destroyed by irony. And now we see that nothing beside remains, which completes that idea of irony. That he said to look on him and feel respect and awe, but actually there's nothing left. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So we've come to the end of the poem and these last lines really important in sort of setting the tone in how this poem concludes. Now unlike a lot of sonnets and other poems that might end with like a little kind of moral message at the end, there is no moral conclusion to this poem. What ends, what, fine, what we get at the end of the poem, sorry, is this very simple but striking image of nature being all we can see into the horizon and beyond. So we have beyond, around the colossal wreck, 
boundless and bare, so there's nothing else that's living, nothing else that suggests any sense of a growing future. The lone and level sand, so this is talking about the desert, a very harsh environment, stretch far away. And we've got that sibilance again, which is pulling those words together there, the sands and the stretching far away, emphasising the tirelessness and the timelessness of nature. That's what's got the ultimate power and that's what lasts. We've also got the alliteration of the lone and the level and then the boundless and the bare. So everything about that desert is given more power because of the sound of the poem, because of the alliteration, makes those words work together and give the idea that the desert is something that's got this huge power and becomes this striking image of nature and the environment and how that's more powerful than anything that a human can ever achieve, especially through arrogance and um, pride that's been given the wrong focus. I'm enjoying the little Shelley. Let's not just skip over that. I carry your your little... pocket Shelley. Talk to uh, me about this. The, yeah, so we hear about uh, Ozymandias, the, the statue's wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command, which sort of implies that he wasn't a particularly pleasant man. He was a man that looked at other people in a disdainful way. Mm. And also the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. I think it's so interesting as it's these two contrasting lines. On the one hand, he looked down on his people, but on the other hand, it was him that fed them, which implies a kindness, but it also implies a sense of power. Mm -hmm. Of course. So I think in the short poem within the sonnet, Shelley delivers quite a complicated portrait of mm. the statue depicting the real man. Yeah. My name is Ozymandias. King of kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. To have the words boundless and bare, cold command, they create quite uh, detached and almost callous images when you kind of say them. Colossal wreck, it's like, it kind of shows the futility of how humans are they just strive to control what we can't control. Mm -hmm. Immortality doesn't exist. Yes. And Colossal wreck, that's the perfect juxtaposition. He was massive. Ozymandias, King of Kings. King of Kings. Ozymandias' colossal statues were supposed to give him a kind of eternal life beyond the grave. In Shelley's own time, scientists were trying to harness that very same power. Shelley's wife, Mary Shelley, even heard about experiments where scientists tried to use electricity to reanimate body parts. I saw with shut eyes but acute mental vision the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out. And then, while the working of some powerful engine showed signs of life, and stir with an uneasy, half-vital motion. Mary's nightmare became one of the most famous horror stories ever written. Frankenstein. In what way do you think the Frankenstein story relates to Ozymandias, the poem. Perhaps it's something to do with man not being humble and accepting their own limitations, accepting themselves as just another member, an equal member of mankind, humankind, you know? The Romantics were great proponents of nature. They were celebrants of nature. Um, and so you can imagine that Shelley would have felt that about uh, the idea of trying to lord your oneself above nature. The poem Ozymandias and the story of Frankenstein both deal with what can happen when our pride and arrogance make us believe we can conquer nature and death. In the end, it will all be swept away by time. But perhaps Percy and Mary Shelley did find a kind of immortality as they live on in their ideas and in their work. So hopefully what you can understand now from the poem is this idea of it being a symbol. The ruined statue is a symbol for the fact that political power and human achievement is temporary, that tyrants are obliterated by nature, that no matter how a human thinks that they can use their arrogance and their power and violence and aggression to control people, in terms of the future and time, it will never last. Nature will always 
prevail. Nature will always be more powerful. So political power, power of humanity is ephemeral. It doesn't last very long. And that's how the metaphor of the poem works. OK, so what you already know about the exam is that you're not going to be writing about this poem in isolation. The question's going to be asking you to compare this poem with another poem from the Power and Conflict collection. So it's really important that once you've got an understanding of it, that you start to think about how you could compare this poem with other poems that you have read. And this video would last a very long time if I did this in any detail, but I thought it might be helpful just to start listing a few poems where I can see you should be able to find some quite quick similarities. So if we start with London by Blake, you've got another romantic poet who's speaking out against oppressive establishment and celebrating that idea of individual liberties. So there's a lot there that you can do with context and with the ideas. And the same for Wordsworth in Prelude. He's also a romantic poet and he explores this idea of the sublime being in awe of nature and its power over humanity. So again, there's a lot you could do with those poems in comparison. In My Last Duchess by Browning, you've got two poets who are mocking the arrogance and this human desire for permanent power and control over something or somebody or a group of people. So again, there are some ideas there that would be interesting for you to look at. Charge of the Light Brigade by Tennyson, you might think that they don't seem very similar in terms of their themes, but what both poets are doing is they're responding to events that happened in their lifetime and they're using their poetry in the hope that they can affect change in how a moment or a person or an idea is perceived and remembered. So that could be an interesting thing to look at as well. In Exposure by Owen, you've got the power of nature in terms of conflict, in terms of war, and how nature actually is more threatening than, than the violence of war and the enemy. So that would definitely be an interesting thing to look at. And again, in Storm on the Island by Heaney, you've got the obvious power of nature again. But there's also, if you look at Storm on the Island as a metaphor for being about... Um, the situation in Ireland and this idea of being about government actions, that could be quite an ambitious comparison to look at. In Bayonet Charge by Hughes, you've got the hair, so symbolising nature, and that hair exposes the fragility of patriotism and human pride. That'd be a really interesting comparison. In Tissue by Darker, you've got the idea that humans in tissues are wrongly trying to create permanence and misunderstanding that life can't be like that, that life is more fragile and actually beautiful because it's fragile and it doesn't last forever. So again that's quite an ambitious comparison but I think could be brilliantly done if you spent some time thinking about that one. And then checking out my history from Agard, you've got another clear voice of protest against the establishment there. So that should be a fairly straightforward one to look for comparisons with. And then finally in Kamikaze by Garland, you've got another layered narrative approach. And you've also got this theme that nature's more powerful than pride, particularly more powerful than patriotism. So I really hope this has helped you feel that you can understand the poem and now go on to do some more individual work with it. Just to recap, I said at the beginning I wanted you to be able to do these three things. So we've got AO1 that you now can read the poem and you understand the main feelings and attitudes that Shelley's expressed. AO2, you could have a look at the language, the form, the structure and have something to say about why Shelley has used the sonnet or how he's used it, how he's used things like alliteration and irony and that layered narrative approach. And then finally, the context, the AO3. So really important that you remember Shelley is a romantic poet and how that influences the main message that he's giving in this poem. Thank you for listening.